Hey y'all, my name is Warren McAdams. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and today I wanted to discuss the GMFM, or the Gross Motor Function Measure. In this video, I'll discuss both the GMFM 88 and the 66, the 88 being the standard version and the 66 being the abbreviated. I'll also discuss what each entails, when to use one over the other, and I'll probably wrap up with some important comments to note as well. But I do recommend watching the video in its entirety as this outcome measure is surprisingly deceptively easy, but I've seen some PTs who have practiced for many, many years um, come to realize that they've been using perhaps the, the 66 when they should have been using the 88 or vice versa. So uh, hopefully this video helps. And I want to start by discussing what the GMFM even is. It's essentially an observational scale, meaning we as clinicians or facilitators of the tool just sit back and watch. Uh, if motivation is an issue, we can go ahead and coax them into participating, but we shouldn't be directly or manually intervening. So keep that in mind. Um, in regards to the reliability and validity of this measure, it's actually really, really good. Um, primarily for the population of cerebral palsy, and especially those from five months of age to 16 years of age who possess motor skill equivalents to that equal to or less than five years of age. So you're not really gonna be using this in the sports, peds, ortho setting where you've got a 13 year old gymnast who's doing backflips. Um, but given the significant age range that this assessment is applicable for, I use this tool a lot on my kiddos with CP who are starting to age out of the PDMS2, given that assessment caps at six years of age. And if you're not familiar with the PDMS2, I highly recommend checking out my video on that. Uh, I'll post it in the description below. The PDMS2 has been a <laughs> very long time favorite of mine given its high utility and incredible descriptive value. Uh, again, I'll, I'll post a link in the description below in case you find that helpful. Uh, but back to the GMFM. I'll say that with the 88 version, despite its primary population being cerebral palsy, I do use this assessment with other conditions like Down syndrome and spinal muscular atrophy since it's been validated in those populations as well. There's also support in the literature for the GMFM 88's use in traumatic brain injury and myotonic dystrophy. I have used it in those settings, not as much just because there are other tests and measures that you can use that I kind of prefer. Um, but I am not quite as confident in the supporting literature for the reliability and validity of its use in Duchenne's, Becker's, and congenital muscular dystrophies. Uh, each of those three, mm, they vary quite substantially. Um, so I, I don't know if I trust the literature fully to, to use it um, on those cases, but um, there is some evidence in the literature to substantiate its use in those populations. Um, and, and while it may be exploratory and supplemental as an assessment tool for mitochondrial or lysosomal storage diseases, I'm also really skittish in those populations as well, given the significant diversity of patient presentations for those diseases. Um, but perhaps the one I see most that irks me the most is when it's used in a spinal cord injury an individual or an individual who has sustained a spinal cord injury. Uh, I feel that it's a little inappropriate for that um, and the literature is quite debatable. Uh, but to describe more of the GMFM in its entirety, it's broken up into five dimensions. You've got lying and rolling, you've got sitting, you've crawling, you've got crawling and kneeling, and then your third one is a coupling of three tasks. And I kind of think of these as the, the moving point A to point B type so we're talking about walking, running, jumping, those kinds of things. Um, ideally, this test initially took me perhaps 60 minutes when I was first starting to perform it. Um, but 
now it perhaps only takes about half that time, so about 30 minutes or so on an in initial eval that is. On a reevaluation with a kiddo I'm, I'm very comfortable with, takes maybe 10 minutes, and that's whether I'm doing the 66 or the lengthened 88 version. Um, so my preference is typically to use the 88 given its increased descriptive value. And while the initial time investment might seem high, it really does pay off once competency is achieved. Uh, when you're talking about finishing this for re-evals in 10 minutes, that's, that's a really nice assessment tool to use, especially if you're on a crunch for time for whatever reason. Um, now, as a rule of thumb, the gross motor function classification system, uh, aka the GMFCS, is a great tool you can use to start getting an indication that perhaps the GMFM might be a good tool to use for your particular kiddo. And I have that here. And essentially, it's just a, a chart with descriptions for each kiddo. And I'll post a link to this in the description below as well. Um, but for example, if your child resides in levels two through five of the GMFCS, the GMFM might be a great tool for you to use. Um, and the higher your GMFCS level, the greater the indication for the use of the GMFM 88 over the 66. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the GMFCS, um, again, I will post the link in the description below, um, but it's a really simple chart, uh, pictures to go. Um, when you think about this particular chart that I'll post, it's in relationship to children six to 12 years of age. And um, at the very top, these are children who can run around, who can navigate their home and school well. Uh, they don't need upper extremity assistance on stairs, and that would be a, a level one, uh, or the lowest involvement. And a level five is the opposite end of the spectrum. So these are children who require uh, someone to push them around in their manual wheelchair. Um, they use standards, they use, uh, again, manual wheelchairs, not gait trainers. If they're using gait trainers, they're typically around that level three. Um, but anyways, the higher the, the grade or the higher the level of the GMFCS, the more indicated we're thinking the, the 88 would be over the 66. So um, let's say you're wanting now to distinguish when you should use the 66 versus the 88 outside of that. So in addition to the 66 being less time consuming, it can be a bit more convenient as well if you memorize a simple algorithm, and that algorithm is right here. Um, it's quick, super easy. I'll post a link to this in the description below as well. Um, but essentially, it's something that directs you very quickly to one of four different item sets, um, and they're ordered in increasing difficulty. It becomes easier and more convenient with respect to tracking change in the same child over time. And granted, the 88 also is ordered in increasing difficulty, uh, just not as overtly. Um, there are some parts where the 88 does have clear flip-flops, but the 66 is really only validated in children with cerebral palsy, whereas in contrast, as previously mentioned, um, the 88 can be used in other cases like Down syndrome, SMA, TBIs, and potentially the others as well. Um, regardless of diagnosis though, going back to that rule of thumb, the higher GMFCS, the more indicated 88 is going to be. Um, Another important factor dictating if I'll use the 66 or the 88 would be the use of orthoses. If a child requires footwear, orthoses, or any other mobility aid, then I'll be using the 88 for sure. <laughs> if they're able to perform all of the anticipated tasks barefoot, go ahead and go with the 66 if, if the other criteria are met. Um, if you're looking for a better motor descriptor for your child, you've got the extra time, 
um, just to sum things up, especially if they require orthoses, they have that higher GMFCS, probably you're gonna go with the 88. Uh, okay, so especially if they've got those other diagnoses non-CPU, okay? And then to sum up the flip side, if you're looking for a quick, convenient route, a kid does not require orthoses or testing, or, or for the testing, or your child has a lower GMFCS classification to their cerebral palsy, the 66 is your option. Okay, so I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but it's pretty important that those are ingrained, <laughs> okay? So I want to move on now to the primary limitations of the GMFM. So for me personally, the most common reason why I might not use this in a child who is ambulatory would be the simple lack of access to stairs. Unless there are stairs at your disposal, you'll have to omit a couple items and that might potentially result in an incomplete examination. The next limitation that I find quite overt um, is the assessment's lack in ability to assess the actual quality of movement. Um, and it's also coupled with an inability to lack or, or to gauge uh, severity of asymmetries. And that's primarily because this outcome measure only tracks the level of task completion. Okay, so, um, oh, and actually, before I forget, uh, as a side note, I should mention that an incredibly important consideration pertaining to this particular assessment is that you may become incredibly comfortable with this tool and with your understanding of what your child can or can't already perform. And that might lead you to the assumption that you can accurately guess the child's responses appropriately. And while that may be true and something you could perhaps do in some other outcome measures, it may not be appropriate here. You might come out one or two points skewed from reality. And on this assessment, that's huge. That is quite a substantial margin of error cons considering that the MCID is more so, more or less than a singular point. <laughs> So please, 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 <laughs> and don't assume a child's level of response if you're not absolutely certain of it. Um, in the event I think of something else that's pretty pertinent, I'll go ahead and include that in the description below along with some helpful links. Uh, you can go to access, like for example, the GMFM um, 88, the 66, uh, the GMFCS, um, and any other links that I mentioned. Uh, in regards to you as a viewer though, I'm actually really interested in all of your commentary as I'm still quite new to making these videos. So every bit of feedback will help as far as me constructing future videos. So please, please tell me what you liked. Um, what would you have liked me to include? Um, any ideas for future videos? Um, things that you might find helpful. Um, and if you could actually also like and subscribe, that would be uh, great for me simply to get an idea as to whether anybody's even watching these videos. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I hope you'll have a very, very wonderful day and that you'll keep learning as much as you can every day.